sit and munch. They shout and stay silent. They strike, boycott, and occupy. They take to the airwaves and the streets. They witness to what Main Street misses. They take a stand. They protest. We were born out of protest. We are not phobic. We do not hate. We are agents of change, compelled by the love of Christ. We stand on scripture alone. By faith alone. Through grace alone. In Christ alone. For God's glory. We are Protestant. Every time, I love it. We're going to watch it five times <laughs> every week to remind you, okay? Um, so we're in a series called We Are Protestant, and we're talking about the Reformation, uh, the Protestant Reformation that happened fi- started 500 years ago. Um, this Tuesday is October 31st. October 31st is um, what was known as All Saints Eve, Okay, All Saints Day Eve, sorry, because November 1st is All Saints Day. There are actually still some calendars uh, that actually say November 1st is All Saints Day. And it's on All Saints Day Eve, the day before All Saints Day, that Martin Luther, German monk um, in the 1500s who nailed the 95 Theses on the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. And we are taking the next couple weeks to continue to celebrate this. Uh, and if you don't know the story, really, for you to hear it for the first time, um, but if you do know the story, for us to be reminded of why we believe in what we believe and what's been recovered through this really important event. And um, as we learned last week, right, how precious the Word of God is to us as Christians. And so I'm hoping, uh, again, this is a different kind of series. We're not really walking through the Bible. We are really walking through history. Uh, I'm hoping that you get a sense of how God is working during this time. And if God's working 500 years ago in the midst of Europe and really reforming and transforming and bringing back the power of the gospel, that that's what God does in us, right? If God can move then, why can't God move now in our own lives? And so I want you guys to feel that and understand that. That said, before we head over into sort of the new part of moving forward in history, I want to do a brief recap of what was happening during the 1500s. Okay, so during the 1500s, the superpower of the world was not a particular nation. It was the Catholic Church. And the most powerful man in the world at this time was actually the Pope. Whoever the Pope was during this time, they were the most powerful person because they had control over the kings and queens over the countries in Europe that were a part of what they called at the time the Holy Roman Empire. And by Roman, they really mean the Holy Catholic Empire. And it was this idea that church and state were kind of tied together loosely, but that the Pope, because he was the religious uh, central figure of the world at the time, he was the most powerful person. And so if you wanted um, to do uh, anything religious and you wanted to receive God's grace, it had to come through the Pope and his governmental structure. It had to come through the way that church was ordered by the Pope himself. And so if you wanted to feel God's grace, you would have to go to the priests, who would go through the bishops, who would go to the Pope himself. And it was during this time that I want to explain to you kind of how the Catholic Church worked. So inside of the, each Catholic Church, you're going to see um, an altar, okay? And this altar is at the center of the church. It's at the front of the church. It's the main focal point. And it's on this altar that the priests would actually do their mass service, their communion service, okay, the Eucharist as it's called. And the idea was that the priest would lift up the bread, lift up the wine, um, declare in Latin, this is my body, this is my blood, right? And those elements would be transported or transubstantiated uh, into something else entirely. It would actually become Jesus' flesh and blood. And the priest would drink of the wine. The priest would take up a body. He would take communion, not everybody else. He would take communion. And then if you were a part of that service, if you were a part of that mass, a little bit of grace was given to you to absolve you of your sin and to make you right with God. And this was happening every single day in every single Catholic church across the entire Catholic empire. 
And it was through this mass that people came to receive God's grace. And these Catholic priests would lift up the bread and wine every single day, essentially re-sacrificing Jesus on the cross every single day, offering Jesus' life to God on the altar on behalf of sins every single day. Um, another thing that was happening during this time was that because the people felt uneasy that somebody else was taking the communion for me, right? there began to develop this theology, right, that actually you can't just come to the Mass. There were all these other things you had to do. You had to do penance. You had to come up to the priest and confess. And the priest, after you confess your sins, the priest would ask you more questions, questions that are actually designed to help you recognize how much of a sinful person you are. Questions like, have you thought and lifted up anything other than Jesus today? Have you thought more highly of any creature or any person in your life more than Jesus, more than God? And so eventually what happened was the people started to look at Jesus really fearfully. And because they started to look at Jesus fearfully, they developed this theology of like, wait, I can't talk to Jesus directly anymore because Jesus is my judge. He's not my savior, he's my judge. So who can I talk to to give a good word to Jesus? And they were like, oh, obviously Jesus' mom, she must be nice. I'll talk to Jesus' mom, I'll talk to Mary, Mary will talk to Jesus, and I'll be okay. But eventually, again, that kind of trickles down, and then Mary became really scary, and Mary became really judgmental. So where do you go? You go to Jesus' grandmother, because grandmothers are the nicest people in the world. So you go to Saint Anne, is what they called her, right? And so you had all over, right, the Catholic Empire, you had these stained glass windows, these relics, these statues dedicated to Mary, eventually dedicated to Anne, and then eventually dedicated to Peter and Paul and James and all of the other saints, right? Throughout history, they would just lift up people, just call them saints, and churches would be named after them, right? And so what happened was you had in the 1500s this weird thing where there was a church, but there was all sorts of weird idolatry and weird worship going on. Every church had named themselves after a saint, right? And then they would have these relics. They were objects, okay, that were basically supposedly belonging to specific saints, and they would be kind of placed all over the place. People would come and touch those things, pray on those things. And the idea was that there was this desperate sense of looking for something to resolve me of my guilt, and they were looking for it everywhere, but they had left behind the idea that you are forgiven for your sin by Jesus Christ. And it was into this atmosphere, into this point in history, that the German monk, Martin Luther, okay, nailed the 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. Okay? So I want you guys to understand, like, this is really, really, really important stuff. Because it's at this point that... This is the beginning of sort of recovering the things that we take for granted, okay? And you'll see kind of how this works together. Um, so Martin Luther was born in November 10 in 1483. He was born in a poor mining town of Eilben in central Germany. His parents' names were uh, Hans and Margaret Luder, L-U-D-E-R, okay? And I'll tell you kind of how that works. So uh, Hans and Margaret Luder had a son, and when they went to the church to baptize their son, that particular day at church, they were uh, venerating, right, which means to honor a particular saint, and they were honoring a Saint Martin, right? And so the church would actually pick a saint, and so every single day, a new saint would be venerated. And the day that uh, Martin was sent to be baptized, they happened to be venerating Saint Martha, so Saint Martin, so Martin was named after Saint Martin, so he became Martin Luther, okay? Now, Martin Luther was really, really bright. He was super smart, very, very intelligent, and his dad saw that early on, and his dad was like, oh my goodness, my son is brilliant, right? He needs to become a lawyer, right? I think his dad was kind of like, a Korean person or something, right? Just knew, like, lawyer, right? And so he wanted him to become a lawyer. And so he actually spent a lot of time, energy, and money making sure that Martin had things to read, constantly was able to study, was good at writing and teaching as well. And eventually he was accepted to uh, the local university, the University of Erfurt. And it was there, actually, that Martin really became convinced that he needed to become a lawyer. And his last name, Luther, was kind of a common name. And so he changed his own name to not be Luther anymore, but to be Luther, which is far more prestigious and cool-sounding so that he could be lawyer Luther instead of Luther, okay? 
But one of the uh, interesting quirks about Martin was that he was actually really obsessed with religion as well. Um, he loved studying religious figures, and one of the figures was Prince Wilhelm of Anhalt in Germany, who was a, a prince that basically gave up the royalty to become a Franciscan monk, okay? And Franciscan monks look like this, yes? Um, they had a certain shaved head, they wore the monk robe, and so this Prince Wilhelm gave up his royalty to become a Franciscan monk because this Prince Wilhelm wrestled with sin. Right? He was convinced that he was not good enough, okay, just being a prince, that he needed to lower himself to become a monk, to forget all of his royalty, to become as poor and as humble as possible, to try to work off his sin. Right? And this, this Prince Wilhelm was famous for actually going to the center of the courtyard and beating himself up because he was punishing himself for his sin. He would also starve himself. And for whatever reason, that person stuck in Luther's head. That person stuck in Martin's head as somebody who's really noble and took his faith seriously. And it actually kind of captured Martin's heart. And so Martin was kind of obsessed with this guy and really studied religion at, um, alongside of his uh, law textbooks and stuff. And there was a time when Luther was 21, a couple years into university. He was actually visiting his parents. And after he was done having dinner with his parents, he decided to walk back to school. As he was walking back to school, a sudden storm hit, okay? Now, Germany is not a tropical country, so I don't know why a suddenly a storm would come. But suddenly a storm came, and Luther was kind of caught in the rain, and he was running in the rain, and there was lightning and thunder. It was really, really intense, right? And then, out of nowhere, a lightning bolt strikes so close to Martin Luther that he's actually thrown off the ground. He didn't get hit by lightning, but he thought he had because the impact of the lightning next to him threw him across, right? It's almost like a dynamite bomb kind of explodes, and you know how you see people flying, right? So as Martin Luther's flying through the air because of this lightning bolt that had struck right next to him, right? As he's flying to the air, he has these thoughts, okay? And that kind of happens. You know how something kind of intense happens, and you feel like life is in slow motion, and you think through all these thoughts, right? So as he's flying through the air, he's thinking, this is it. This is how I'm going to die, right? And he's thinking, I haven't had my last rites read to me. The last time I went to confession was a couple days ago. If I land on the ground and I die, I think I'm going to go to hell. I haven't worked off my sin. Or I'm going to go to purgatory for a really, really long time. And as he's flying through the air, he's just thinking all of a sudden of it, what his eternal life is going to be like. And then he lands on the ground and because he had that thought, when he landed on the ground, he shouted out, Saint Anne, help me. I will become a monk. Just flew out of his mouth, right? It's like it was here, and then when he landed, it just kind of popped out of his mouth, right? And so he's standing there, and then, you know, he's, he's obviously dazed because he had just been, almost been hit by lightning. And he stands up, and he realizes that his religious studies kind of led him to this idea that he should become a monk because he knows that he's not um, forgiven for his sin. He needs to work it off. So he, he goes back to his father and says, Dad, I'm not going to finish uh, becoming a lawyer. I need to go and become a monk. I have to work off my sin. Eternity is, eternity is at stake. It doesn't matter if I become a lawyer. Martin Luther was convinced that this is what he had to do. Now his father, Hans, was furious. Right? His father was so angry at him because he was throwing away his future that Hans, his father, actually said, you're not doing the Lord's work, you are actually doing the devil's work. And so with that blessing, okay, Martin Luther decided to become a Franciscan monk. And what was crazy was Martin Luther loved it. Okay? He loved the idea that he could finally work off his guilt. Right? And this is what he said about becoming a monk. He said, we young monks smacked our lips for joy over such delightful talk about our holy monkery, right? Because when you became a monk, your lifestyle became set. Everything you did was on a really rigid schedule, right? They had rules on when you wake up, rules on when to go to sleep. Every couple hours, there was a mass service that you had to attend, right? It was like every three or four hours, even into the middle of the night, so every three, four hours, they would have to go to the service, they would have to do their mass, they'd have to do the communion, they would have to participate in all those things, they would have to pray the prayers, walk the walk. They even had rules on how many bites you were allowed to take of certain kinds of food, what food you ate during certain kinds of the day. It was great for somebody who was struggling with guilt because now he had a schedule for how to work it all off. 
But as he was doing this for a longer period of time, over a couple years, he actually started to think, this is kind of empty. How long am I supposed to do this? And he became increasingly more troubled because he was thinking, what if actually this isn't enough? Because I'm so good at keeping the schedule. It can't be this easy. It actually has to be harder than this because I know my sin. I know how wicked I am, right? And then he realized actually that, you know, if he thought somebody was pretty, he was like, am I lusting, right? If he enjoyed a joke too much, he was like, is my laughter causing me to take things too lightly, right? If I don't sing well, what if God's displeased with my singing? So he would practice singing. He would do all of this stuff because he just wasn't sure that what he could do was enough, right? And so when he would go to confession, the priests hated seeing Martin Luther because when he would do confession, the average confession, the Catholic confession at the time would last anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes. You know how long Luther would keep the priest with him? Six hours. Every time. Six hours. Just like, and then I woke up and I had this weird thought about this girl that I may, may th- I thought she was pretty and I just need to confess that. And then I woke up and I, th- I saw my breakfast and I was like, again? But I quickly, you know, prayed a prayer of forgiveness, but I have to tell you, like, that breakfast wasn't that good. And so I, for- I-, I sinned there and I wasn't as grateful as I should have been. And then as I was tying my monk robe, I got, like, I, there was a scratch and I was kind of ungrateful for the underwear that I had. Like, they, he would list off every single little tiny thought that he had and it would drive the priests nuts. But they couldn't do anything because they just had to sit there and just listen to this guy over and over and over again. But that was kind of how intense he was about his sin, right? But then the worst part was at the end of six hours confession, the priest would be so tired, they'd be like, okay, just say Hail Mary once and you're fine. Your, your sins have been forgiven because they were exhausted. They just wanted to get out of there. They didn't want to have to give him a penance, something he had to do for every single sin because then they would be there for six hours reading back and because you did this, now you have to do this. There's a, and, and so Martin Luther would be like, I just gave you six hours worth of my heaviest stuff and you're telling me all I have to do is say Hail Mary once or I just have to rake the garden once? Like that doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like the, the, the punishment matches the crime, right? But he was respected because he was smart, right? So in 1507, he was actually given a chance to uh, lead the mass service. And this is a big deal. This is, this is him kind of becoming, right, uh, recognized for his holiness, his personal holiness. He's thinking, okay, God is pleased with me, which is why God is letting me do this. It's what he's kind of thinking, or maybe he's pleased with, I don't know, but I have this opportunity. And so it was at this time, actually, that his dad kind of came around to the idea that he was going to become a priest. And his dad was like, oh, my son, who could become a priest? And priests were actually well, uh, they were prestigious, they were well known in the towns, and his dad was thinking, oh yeah, okay, you know what, if he's a priest, I could handle that. And so his dad decided to come bring the entire family to Luther's very first mass service. It was a big deal for the young monk to become the lead priest to do the entire mass service. And it started off really well. Martin Luther had been practicing singing, saying the hymns. He practiced his Latin, make sure his pronunciation was correct. And so he's doing all of these things. And then he gets to the altar, and now he has to do the actual mass itself. He has to offer the communion itself. And he was real good up until that point, right? But what you do is before you um, lift up the bread, and remember, we talked about this last week. When you lift up the bread, right, and you say, this is my body, in Latin, that phrase is hoc est corpus meum, right? This is my body. That's what it means in Latin. And it's actually where we get the phrase hocus pocus, okay? It's the idea that, again, you say these magical words, the bread becomes Jesus' flesh, and then the priest takes it on behalf of the people, and they are absolved of their sin. Grace is given to them. But before the priest does those things, the priest actually offers a prayer. It's the prayer for the communion that actually made Martin Luther pause. And the prayer was this. We offer unto thee the living, the true, the eternal God. We offer unto thee the living, the true, the eternal God. It was here that Martin Luther paused. Now, if you do any public speaking, you know that pausing is a good way to bring up some drama. When you get quiet, when you pause, some tension builds up. When the tension's too long, it becomes awkward. 
And when the awkwardness goes on too long, it becomes painful, right? And when the painfulness becomes too long, the old priest comes over and removed Martin from where he was. He just froze. He couldn't get himself to lift the bread up to say, hoc est corpus meum, because he was fixated on the phrase, the living, the true, eternal God. It hit Martin Luther at that moment in front of the altar that he had to offer something to the true, the living, eternal God. And he just realized in that moment, I'm not worthy to do this. I have to confess for eight hours my sin before I'm allowed to do that. I didn't do that. And so he started rolling through the sins of the day. And he realized, I, I can't do this. So he just froze. And he froze for so long, it got so embarrassing that his dad was so mad. Right? He was just furious at him. The old priest had to come and finish the service. But Martin Luther was just, that was so traumatic for him. The idea that he had to come and say something before God. He would say this later about that moment. He said, At these words, I was utterly stupefied and terror stricken. I thought to myself, With what tongue shall I address such majesty, seeing that all men ought to tremble in the presence of even an earthly prince? Who am I that I should lift up mine eyes or raise my hands to the divine majesty? The angels surround him. At his nod, the earth trembles. And shall I, a miserable little pygmy, say, I want this, I ask for that? For I am dust and ashes and full of sin and I'm speaking to the living, eternal, and the true God. This messed him up. And so for the next three years, actually, Luther poured his life into figuring out how he would ever make it to the point where he can offer a sacrifice to God. So he started to study scripture like crazy because he thought to himself, you know what, if the answer is anywhere, it has to be in the word of God. It has to be in the word of God that there are answers, right? Because again, I told you guys last week, there was this rumbling movement of like, you know what? The true authority last, lies in scripture, right? And that had implications all over the Catholic church at the time. And there were pockets of people who were coming to recognize, actually, the Bible is where we need to get our answers from. And so Luther is pouring over the Old Testament and New Testament, looking for a way to absolve his guilt so that he could actually become a priest, and it was during this time, in uh, three years later, okay, in um, 1510, that um, he came upon verses like this, right? Uh, Luke 18, 18 through 19. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And it's verses like this that made Luther pause and ask himself, wait a second, if Jesus says that he's not even good, then how in the world am I supposed to be good enough to offer to God alone? Now, Luther at the time didn't understand that's not what Jesus was asking. And Luther would become one of the people that would really interpret this well. But it was this idea that he would see these kinds of things over and over in Scripture, and he would recognize, man, it's not easy to be forgiven for your sin. There's something else. And so it was at this time in 1510 that he was actually allowed to go to Rome. He was sent on a basically an errand to go to Rome to go to the capital of the Catholic Church. And Luther was thrilled. All the things he'd been studying for the last three years, he was thinking, oh, in Rome, I can absolve my guilt even more because that's where all the true saints are buried. That's where all the true relics are, right? Like St. Peter's body is buried underneath St. Peter's church. Like I can go there and I can pray and I can smell the air there and God will be more pleased with me in that location. So he went to Rome, stacked up visit after visit after visit of all the important saints, all the important churches, visited every single one, was busy driving those priests nuts in Rome, confessing all of his sin over and over again, going to all of these places. And there was a specific place called the Scala Scanta, okay? Sorry, the Scala Sancta, okay? And this was the staircase that they thought Jesus climbed, okay, to get to Pilate to be judged. And so this staircase, okay, was famous for um, a particular thing that you did to get more grace from God. And basically what you did was every step you took, you would say the Lord's Prayer, and then you would bend down and you would kiss the step. And then you would go to the next step, say the Lord's Prayer, bend down, kiss the step. Go one more, Lord's Prayer, bend down, kiss the step. All the way up to the top. And when Luther got to the top, for whatever reason, his heart dropped. And he actually was like, wait a second. What if the reason why I'm feeling so inadequate 
is not because I don't have enough points, right? Because to him, religion was a point system. It was a game where your sins brought you negative points, and the work you did for God gave you positive points. And he got to the top of the stairs, and for the first time in his life, he thought to himself, what if it's not the point system, right? It's not that I don't have enough points, but what if the game is actually wrong? That's what he thought to himself. What if this entire system is not actually how you're forgiven for your sin? And then he had an opportunity to go to a very special lady. Um, she was called the Maid of Augsburg. And this lady, apparently, legend had it, that the reason why she was living was because every time there was mass done on her behalf, she would become healthy. So she was a sick old lady, but every time mass was done on her behalf, she would be healthy. Right? And so Luther thought to himself, I need to visit her because if the game is correct then she's the person that can tell me about what that experience is like. Because I'm not having that experience of forgiveness. This lady is being filled with life every time someone does mass for her. There's some supernatural experience happening there. I have to see that. I have to experience that for myself. So he goes and he visits her and he talks to her and he realizes something. She doesn't even care about God. She can't answer a single coherent question about who Jesus is or who God is or what the church does. In fact, this lady is basically pagan. He was crushed by that. And so he returned home, ultimately really discouraged because he didn't get the resolvement of his sin that he had wanted. And so the, the order that he was a part of, the church he was a part of, recognized that he was really, really depressed. Okay, and I'm going to talk more about this uh, next week, but Luther was also kind of crazy, as in his character. Like, he just did kind of crazy things. And I think the church just didn't want to handle that anymore. And they recognize that he's actually a pretty good teacher because, again, his mind was really sharp. And he had a way of writing that was really, really, really um, friendly towards lay people. And so they were like, you know what? Let's have him go to another place and become a Bible teacher. I think that will actually help him out, lift him out of his depression, lift him out of his sort of crazy stuff that he's doing. And then we don't have to deal with him. So they sent him to a place called Wittenberg in Germany. This would be the most colossal mistake the Roman Catholic Church makes. Because essentially what they did was, they said, don't be a monk anymore. You don't have to go by this schedule. Because the way Luther studied scripture was, he would sneak it into everything in between the monk schedule. But now that he was being sent to Germany to actually be a Bible teacher, he didn't have to do the monk stuff anymore. He was resolved from that. All he had to do was sit, read the Bible, and teach it. And you know what happens when you sit and you read the Bible? things change. That was the colossal mistake. That was the tear, right, that would allow Martin Luther to kind of punch through the wall. And it was at this church, as he was studying the Bible, that things completely transformed for him. Now, this church is interesting, the, the church in Wittenberg. It's still there. It's called the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany. You can still go and you can see it. But at the time, this church had 19,000 relics, okay? And these were things like a, a, a wisp of straw from Christ's crib, a strand from Jesus' beard, a nail from his cross, a piece of bread from the Last Supper, a twig from Moses' burning bush, a few of Mary's hairs and some bits of clothing, as well as um, innumerable teeth and bones from celebrated saints. 19,000 of these things spread out all of the church. Can you imagine you just walk in and you see like the femur of St. Paul's <laughs> teeth of these different people and like weird pieces of hair and, and twigs and branches and everything has like a rope and a little label next to it and people are just going and praying to these things. It's crazy times, right? But that's what they did. And so this was the church that Martin Luther was went to go and he was supposed to teach here. And it was during this time that he actually ran into the indulgence system. I talked about this last week. The indulgence system was this idea that actually just shortcut the whole mass thing, Right? The Pope has the ability to unlock heaven's works, okay? So uh, that is it. If you want to get to heaven, you have to do X amount of works, right? And some people did so many works, and they did so many masses, they had extra credit. So when they get to heaven, all that extra credit gets placed into a treasure chest in heaven. And the person that can unlock the treasure chest is the Pope. The Pope has the keys to heaven. So he can unlock it, and he can take those extra credit things and give it out to people, okay? 
And so this theology was called the buying and selling of indulgences, right? So the idea was that the Pope would sign these papers that say, I absolve you or I give you X amount of extra credit. And so wealthy people would just buy those indulgences and they'd live however they wanted to because they didn't have to do good works. They just had enough papers to cover them, right? And the, the, the Roman Catholic Church would use that to actually pay for all of their construction projects and all the things that they were doing. Super corrupt at the time. Right? But everybody did it because it was just kind of what they believed in. But Martin Luther had been studying scripture for so long, he was like, that's not right. There's no way you could pay your way to salvation. That is not correct. I know because I had pained myself to try to gain forgiveness, and the idea that you could just walk in and buy it, no way. Okay? Now, Luther was very colorful in his language. Okay? And he was very, very colorful in his language. Okay? Uh, and you'll see some of that stuff next week. But the idea is Luther was... So mad. So he just started writing. Okay? He started writing and writing and writing, and eventually he ended up with what was called the 95 Theses because there was a gentleman in town who was named John Tetzel, Johann Tetzel. And Johann Tetzel rode through town, and he said things like, when the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. He would make up these weird little jingles. Right? He was kind of like the first advertiser jingle man, and he would run all across the city saying these jingles, and it would get caught in people's heads. And they would repeat these things and they'd be convinced, oh yeah, right? If I just buy this, then my ancestors will be freed from purgatory, right? Um, he would say, place your penny on the drum, the pearly gates open and in strolls mum. Right? Like he would make up these rhymes. And Luther was so mad, so mad at this guy who takes sin so lightly. So Luther wasn't convinced yet of all the Reformation doctrines, but he knew you are not forgiven for your sins by buying a piece of paper. That doesn't make any sense. So he wrote 95 theses that came from Scripture. And it was kind of really the first time that um, stuff that was in the Bible was being used to defend a theological standpoint. Because previous to this, they just said, the Pope said this, so therefore it's from God. The Pope said this, therefore it's from God. And so Luther was like, no. The Bible says different things than what the Pope says. And Luther had begun to recognize the authority and the weightiness of the Bible. And so on October 31st, on All Saints Day Eve, Luther takes the 95 Theses, knowing that the next day, All Saints Day, the townspeople are going to come to church to take part of the Mass, and he nails it to the door on the Church of Wittenberg. And it explodes. People are talking about it all over town. And actually, that's normally where kind of reformer stories end, generally speaking. But because it was also at this time that the printing press was invented, somebody from town took the 95 Theses, went to a printing press, and started printing copies. And those copies went all over Germany. And the 95 Theses actually were written because Luther wanted to debate Johann Tetzel. And so Johann Tetzel debated him. Now, he lost the debate, but Johann Tetzel was a friend of the Pope. And he actually asked the Pope, to kill Luther for being a heretic. Right? But because Luther was so intelligent and because he was so popular, other priests wanted to debate him. So they actually stopped him from being killed by doing other debates. And what was interesting is those debates would not end up being about indulgences at all. He ended up debating about the authority of Scripture in the end. And that's when everything unlocked. And so as soon as he started to really talk about the authority of Scripture and writing about it in ways in which the lay people can hear, and then pamphlets were being printed by the Gutenberg printing press, the movement started to grow and it went all over the place. It started to spread throughout all of Europe. And it eventually reached Switzerland. Okay? Um, and when it reached Switzerland, it went to, uh, oh, this is the uh, door of the church in, the, uh, in Wittenberg. Um, the original doors that Martin Luther would have nailed at these are actually gone. They were burned out. Um, so the church put up these iron gates, and what they did on the iron gates is they actually carved in Luther's original 95 pieces. You can still go and you can see it today. Um, but there was a um, reformer in Switzerland, and his name was Ulrich Zwingli. Okay? And Zwingli started hearing about the writings that Luther had. And it so inspired Zwingli to start studying the scriptures that he decided to become an expert in Greek, Right? Not read the Latin translation of the Bible, but directly to the source. And he went to the New Testament, he started studying the letters of Paul, and Zwingli started writing as well. And he became such a prolific writer because his goal was actually, he wanted to tell the people that you don't need the priests. You don't need St. Mary. You don't need St. Anne. Because as I'm reading the New Testament, I realize 
Jesus is the head of the church, and I have access to Jesus, and Jesus gives me access to God. So Zwingli actually wrote what's called the 67 Articles, and I'm not going to put all 67, but I'm going to put up a couple that actually talk about okay, Jesus. And listen to the language, okay? He says, The sum of the gospel is that our Lord Jesus Christ, the true Son of God, has made known to us the will of his heavenly Father and redeemed us by his innocence from eternal death and reconciled us to God. Therefore, Christ is the only way to salvation for all who were, who are, and who shall be. Whoever seeks or shows another door, errs, yea, is a murderer of souls and a robber. Christ is the head of all believers. All who live in this head are, mem- are his members and children of God, and this is true. This is the true Catholic Church, the communion of saints. Christ is the one eternal high priest. Christ who offered himself once on the cross is the sufficient and perpetual sacrifice for the sins of all believers. Therefore, the mass is no sacrifice, but a commemoration of the one sacrifice of the cross and a seal of the redemption to Christ. Christ is the only mediator between God and us. Christ is our righteousness. From this it follows that our works are good so far as they are Christ, but not so good as far as they are our own. Christians are not bound to any works which Christ has not commanded. You know, a lot of this language is actually found later on in the confessions and the creeds of the church. And a lot of this language is actually continuing today to be in our songs. You know, previous to this, the church didn't talk about Christ being our righteousness. Yes, it's biblical language, but Zwingli the one that really kind of tied all of these doctrines together, together and really came up with the systematic theology of looking at Jesus. And these writings start to spread all over the place in Switzerland. Now, Zwingli's interesting because he's super famous as a reformer, but he only was a reformer for 12 years. He actually died a dozen years after he started writing and discovering these doctrines for himself. And he died on the battlefield. He was not a soldier. He was a chaplain. He went to the battlefield to pray for soldiers who were dying, for, uh, to pray for soldiers who are, who, are in need of, uh, who are sick, who are in need of healing. And he actually ended up dying with a flag in one hand and a Bible in the other hand. And the man that took over Zwingli's post in Switzerland was a man named Heinrich Bullinger. And Heinrich Bullinger was the one who took Zwingli's writings, continued to produce them, wrote more on top of that, and it started to spread all over Europe. This idea that Jesus is the head of the church, we have access to Jesus, Jesus is our eternal high priest, Jesus is our righteousness. One other thing that's really important about Zwingli is he also had a conviction to actually teach women these doctrines which is different from any of the Catholic teachers beforehand. They didn't bother teaching women anything. But Zwingli knew, if I reach the mothers, if I reach the women, then I will reach the children as well. And we can strengthen Reformation families together. And Zwingli actually made it a point to go to nuns' convents and start preaching the gospel to them, right? And he would do this regularly, so much so that actually one of the things that became a marker of the Reformation is actually, it was not just a men's movement. The men are famous for going out there and teaching and doing all of this stuff. But the Reformation really is the first time that you have women who are empowered by the gospel to share the gospel and live for the gospel. And that's one thing that actually marks the Reformation. And so Zwingli leads to Bullinger, and Bullinger takes Zwingli's materials spreads them out all over the place. It goes to France, Hungary, Poland, and lands even in places like Scotland. And it's in Scotland that we meet a woman named Helen Sturkey, right? And Helen Sturkey wasn't famous for the life that she lived because we don't actually know much about her life, but we know about the way that she died. And in 1544, she gave birth to her last child, her youngest child, And as she was giving birth, the midwives who were with her, the ones helping her to deliver her baby, they were Catholic. And one of the things that you did as you were delivering the baby was you prayed prayers, right? Because back then, they didn't have anesthesia. They had no painkillers. They didn't have Tylenol, aspirin, nothing. You just delivered the baby, right? I don't know why I made that sound. Gross. Uh, you just, you know, you just screamed and you just, right? And again, you guys know, like back then, before the hospitals and all that stuff, a lot of women died during pregnancy. It was a serious thing to give birth right? Because you could die, the baby could die, so many complications. And so the Catholic Church, obviously, when, they, when a woman is giving birth, they're going to pray to the mom who gave birth to Jesus. You know, Mary, give me strength. But Helen Sturkey, because she had read Zwingli's writings, Bullinger's writings, because she knew that actually, I don't need to pray to Mary. I have access to Jesus. What am I praying to Mary for? She refused. So in the midst of giving birth, okay, 
she had a theological argument with her midwives. Her midwives were like, uh, can you pray to Mary, please? Like, she's going to help you. You're in pain. You need Mary to help you. And she's like, no, I refuse to pray to Mary, right? And there would be this back and forth. They'd be like, pray to Mary. And she'd be like, why are you asking me to do this right now? I'm giving birth to a baby. I'm busy right now. And she said this, right? Read this. She said, if I had lived in the days of the virgin, God might have looked likewise to my humility and base state as he did the virgins and might have made me the mother of Christ. And when she said this, all the nuns went, <gasps> right? And you guys are like, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Basically, what she was saying is this. The Virgin Mary is not special in that she was some perfect human being. What made her special was that she was humble. And I am a lowly, humble woman as well. And God could have equally just as much chosen me to become the mother of Mary as well. I mean, the mother of Jesus as well. And that's true, guys. Mary isn't perfect. It wasn't immaculate concept. It wasn't this, she wasn't this perfect person that gave birth to Jesus. She was just a humble young woman who wanted to obey God. And Sturkey knew this. And so she said to these nuns who were delivering her baby, why are you asking me to pray to the Virgin Mary? She's not special in the sense that I need to pray to her. I have access to Jesus. The nuns were so disturbed by the fact that she could even think that she was on the same level as Mary that they reported her to the priest in the city. And the priest in the city did an investigation and they discovered that Helen Sturkey's entire family was a Protestant family. They were studying these in crazy doctrines that had been you know, going on in other parts of the world, but not in Scotland. Uh-uh, we're not going to let this stuff happen here. And so they arrested the entire family, they tried them, and they basically said, you're going to die for blasphemy. And so they agreed that they were going to kill the entire family. Not the children, but her, her and her husband and a couple of their friends. She wanted at least to die with her husband, but the church wouldn't let them because men are supposed to be hung and women are supposed to be drowned. And so they brought them out to the executioner's court and as they were tying up the rope around her husband, James, James's neck. She said to her husband, she was allowed to walk up to him, to kiss him on the cheek, and she said this, Husband, be glad, for we have lived together many joyful days, and this day in which we must die, we ought to esteem the most joyful of all, because we shall have joy forever. Therefore, I will not bid you good night, for we shall shortly meet in the kingdom of heaven. And it's with those words that James was hung and he died. And then she was tossed into a bag, her legs tied up with this heavy, heavy stone and was thrown into the local lake and she died as well. Do you know what she died for? Do you know why she didn't recant of not praying to Mary? Her crime was not praying to Mary because she understood the second sola. She understood that we are saved through Christ alone. And she understood that it's through Christ alone that I'm saved. It's not through Mary. And she knew that if she broke that, then her faith in Christ is not complete. And she knew that it was through Christ alone, and she was willing to die for that. Again, her crime was not praying to the Virgin Mary. This doctrine is really, really important. I know we take it for granted. How could you not believe that you're saved through Christ alone? But during this time, they thought that you were saved through everything else except for Jesus. But it was through the life of Martin Luther, through the life of Zwingli, through the life of even women like Helen Sturkey that we have the grounding and the confidence to say, no, we're not saved through anything else. We're saved through Christ alone. We fall back on the Apostle Peter's words. This is what he said. In the sermon, right? Right after Pentecost, he said, This Jesus is a stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the corner stone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Luther believed in this. Zwingli believed in this. Sturkey believes in this. I believe in this. The question is, do you? Let's pray together.
Heavenly Father, I pray that we would be convinced of this truth again and that we would rejoice in this truth again, that it's through Christ alone that we're saved. God, we know that there are people who died for this truth, and yet it's something that we take for granted because it's just something that we kind of grew up with all the time. But there was a cost paid for this. When you died, there was a cross, there was a cost when Helen Sturkey died. And so I pray, Lord, that you would help us to recognize how expensive this truth is. It wasn't just purchased by you, but there were martyrs who died because of this truth. And so I pray, Lord, that it would become even more precious to us, that we would become enamored over this truth that, wait, it's through Jesus and Jesus alone. It's not through praying to some straws from Jesus' crib or strands of hair or the teeth and the bones of anybody who's died previous. But we worship a Savior who is alive and well today. There are no bones to worship but Jesus because, Jesus, you are resurrected and you are reigning in heaven. And it's through Christ alone that we're saved. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to have complete confidence in that truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.